friend of mine is on and she was uh, catching skunks and, and it's not a skunk. It was a giant possum. All really great wildlife experiences, you know, so. Cool. All right. Well, thanks everyone for hanging in with us. Um, we will go ahead and get started. So welcome to Nebraska Nature Nerd Night. Um, we will be talking about nocturnal animals tonight and we have some awesome nature nerds with us. Um, so if you've been to a nature nerd night before, you kind of know how it, it starts. And so Amber and I are in a little different space here, but we'll do our best. So, and Brett, you're sure you don't want to sing with us tonight? I, I'm all good. Okay. Oh, well, okay. next time we'll hold you to it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Are you ready? If you're a nature loving scientist, we think that you should smile. Be happy like us. Start the breath and nature nerd night. Turtle squishing for the birds and see the fun guy too. If you're a curious brainiac, we've got a show for you. <laughs> well, it's, it wasn't our best, but you know, under pressure, we're okay tonight. So. All right. Well, like I said, we have some awesome um, nature nerds with us tonight. We have actually three nature nerds with us tonight. Um, so we're going to go ahead and introduce them and um, have them kind of tell us a little bit about how they got to be um, nocturnal people and how they like these kind of animals that we have um, that we're talking about tonight. So our first person is going to be Jamie Bachman, who you might have already met. She has been our co-host for the last seven minutes. Working. <laughs> so thank you, Jamie. Uh, Jamie You're Bachman welcome. is a um, wildlife educator with Northern Prairie's Land Trust and kind of a partnership position between that and the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And she's going to be kind of our invertebrate nature nerd person tonight. So moths, beetles, starlight, and constellation ecology kind of stuff. So, um, Brett, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Sure. Okay. So I am Brett Anderson. I work for the Nebraska Indian Parks Commission in our federal aid department. Uh, so I handle our state wildlife grants, uh, which manage a lot of our at-risk species in our state. Uh, I started off with these nocturnal little critters uh, by doing work with bats of all things. Never thought in a million years I'd be saying that, but here I am today. Uh, learned it fit a whole lot more with my lifestyle as I am not a morning person, as I'm sure a lot of you <laughs> can relate to. And uh, so it was really nice to have something else uh, to be able to study. And so there are a lot of times where I go out, basically start my work as soon as the sun went down. And the rule of thumb was we went to bed when the sun came up in the morning. So uh, a little bit different lifestyle for a while. And we just call you our back guy. Yeah. Is yeah. that okay? At that least works. for tonight? Sure. Okay, sweet, <laughs> sweet. All right, and then we actually have one other person joining us from all the way out in Western Nebraska. So Olivia, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Olivia Derevna. I'm the Watchful Wildlife Biologist with Nebraska Game and Parks. Um, and uh, unlike Brett, I am a morning person, not a nocturnal night owl, um, but I grew up catching lightning bugs and just enjoying the sounds of owls. And uh, really for me, it was a field job. I worked in Arizona where uh, I had, I was camping out in the desert and I had skunks scratching to get in my tent and a rabbit digging under my tent trying to make burrows and a barn owl calling overhead. And it really introduced me to a lot of the nocturnal life uh, that's out there and the abundance of it. And it really got me curious and uh, I'm excited to be a uh, part of this uh, talk tonight. That sounds like a, that sounds like a party to me, all those <laughs> If, if it was just one night, it would have been, but considering it was multiple nights, uh, it kind of got old. <laughs> That's understandable. Well, thank you so much all for joining us today. And again, thanks so thanks for hanging on during our fun technical difficulties. It's 2022, you'd think we'd figure Zoom out, but you know, we still run into some fun things, I guess, <laughs> through this. So, so obviously, as uh, Monica mentioned, we're going to be speaking about starlight ecology tonight. And really, we're going to be speaking to, you know, what, what do nocturnal animals have to think about? How does that strategy of being awake when we're most, most of us are sleeping, how does that affect their behavior? How does that affect their physical adaptations? And, and just really like walking through the life of nocturnal animals and how the night sky, the darkness, the starlight, and the, even the moon, which I think tomorrow is the full moon, right? You yeah. turn it off. Yeah. So um, so how does that, how does that affect, you know, we're getting this stuff picked up so we can... ecology and just make sure that if you can make sure you're on mute tonight. 
Um, if there you go, perfect, thank you. Um, but before we get into it, I want to make sure that we define some terms because some of these terms I know that you and I throw around all the time, but I have learned that not everyone knows some of them. So we have we live in a bubble. We live in a bubble, right? We live in a bubble. Um, so so we want to make sure that we define some because they're kind of actually they're cool words, especially if you're an animal nerd and wildlife nerd. It's fun to learn new words. So one of them is diurnal. Raise your hand if you're a diurnal creature. Okay, great. Most of us maybe should be raising our hands. Diurnal is when an animal is mostly awake and active during the day. So most of us, I know my sister was a night shift nurse for a while, so she was not diurnal, but most of us are diurnal creatures, okay? And then the opposite of that, I'm sure most of us are familiar with it, it's nocturnal. So um, nocturnal creatures are mostly active and awake at night. Um, but there's one more word that's cool. It's actually, it was one of my favorite words in college when I first learned it. Oh, really? And I used it oh. all, what are you saying? I just, what a nerd. I'm, okay. I know. That's why we're here. Favorite. Nature Nerd Night. <laughs> yeah. Um, I use it all the time, but it's called crepuscular. If you want everyone repeat crepuscular, at least out loud or to yourself. It's just a fun word to say, crepuscular. Thank you. So crepuscular is when an animal is most active, not just during the day and not just at night, but mostly active during dawn and dusk. So those kind of twilight hours, which is kind of cool. I think of myself as maybe I'm, I should have been a crepuscular creature. I can relate to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I want to like get up super early. It would be awesome to nap during the day and then be up at night a little bit. So, you know, so that's some of the terms that we're defining tonight before we get started. Everyone excited? Everyone ready? Okay. So we learned from our um, nerds tonight what got them into this particular field and also the subject of starlight ecology. And now we want to start talking about the nocturnal creatures. Um, what do you think, and anyone can answer, Olivia, Jamie, or Brett, what are some just challenges in general that nocturnal creatures face um, that maybe we're not used to thinking about? We're used to walking and we're used to doing all our daily activities under the sun and the blue skies. What are some things that, not, if you're a nocturnal creature, do you have to think about um, in order to survive and thrive every day or night? Shout out anything that you have. So something that always fascinates me is how many nocturnal creatures rely on the lunar cycle, so the moon cycle. Like they're really active maybe during a full moon and not active at all uh, when it's a new moon, so no moonlight out. Um, and to me, that's just fascinating. I can't imagine just like stuffing my face like a few nights a month and then not eating anything for a few nights because I can't find food. So um, that that's something that I, I really uh, find uh, fascinating about nocturnal animals, but. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I, you know, I can't think about, you know, when I'm talking about invertebrates or, or, or nocturnal insects, I can't separate them from pollination, you know, because the co coevolution part of that, right? Mm -hmm. so when you, so I have to think about pollinating or I have to think about nocturnal blooming plants as well, right? Because mm -hmm. so hand in hand. So I think it's something like 75% of all the world's um, flowering plants are insect pollinated. And so, um, so there for nocturnal insects and for nocturnal blooming plants, there's this, olo, there's this vision and olfactory trade-off for, you know, for senses. And, and, and I wanted to tell about this really cool nerd study really quick. Let's hear it. Some really huge nerds studied, um, the olfactory neuropills, which is just, um, this network of, of neurons that are associated with, with the sense of smell in okay. diurnal, diurnal hummingbird hawk moths and nocturnal um, uh, elephant hawk moths. Okay, so there's like the olfactory neurons in the brain inside these insects, okay? okay. And, they, and they found that in the nocturnal elephant hawk moths that there is a, there was a, a there's like a, a, a greater association for olfactory, you know, neurons built up there for those diurnal, for those uh, nocturnal insects. And so uh, just like physiologically, 
nerds have found the, the physiological differences in between diurnal and, and nocturnal insects, which I think is really, really super cool. That's super cool. Excited. And yeah. And if you and especially if there's anyone here who doesn't no um, olfactory specifically. Olfactory is essentially the sense of smell, but also influences our sense of taste, right? And so what you're saying, are you saying that they found in the study that the nocturnal critters had more olfactory, like they had a be better sense of smell? Yes, they and showed, so, yeah, the, those, neur they showed greater investment in the development of those neurons in the, in the nocturnal elephant ha hawk moths. That's cool. So is that also, because like they a Oh, go ahead, Jamie. No, no, and 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 then you know, along parallel with that, that there was a behavior behavioral studies too showed that um, nocturnal insects would have um, a, a paid more attention to olfactory cues versus visual cues, which you know, a diurnal insects would would use more visual cues to look for um, yeah. nectar resources and for pollination and and food and energy. So yeah. pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> Got a little. Yeah. Bit so that's super cool. And that's actually something um, Brett cheated a little bit and stopped down in our office today. And we accidentally pre-nerded out about this, about the subject tonight. But he, you were mentioning just the difference in like senses. You know, if you think about during the day, we, what do most of us use? Our, our vision, our eyes. But what were you speaking to about like, as far as how we think about senses at night? What different senses, like Jamie kind of mentioned? Yeah, so essentially what happens is at night, you have to completely shift your senses. We don't have the, the light uh, to benefit us. And so you notice a lot of changes in how animals behave, how they interact with one another. Uh, they'll predominantly use things like their sense of smell and their sense of hearing. Uh, so sound is very important at night. Think about how loud uh, it gets at night uh, with insects trying to communicate with one another. Um, and so there, there are a lot of different factors that are associated with that, uh, but it kind of reflects back on how the animals look and how they behave themselves. As Jamie was talking about, you know, just those neurons um, and how they kind of shift in these hawk moths between a diurnal and a nocturnal species. Think about the coloration of different animals between a diurnal and a nocturnal species mm -hmm. as well. Your birds and things like that are going to be really colorful and really showy during the day your birds that are active at night are going to be really camouflaged because they're not facing their, you know, kind of showiness to, to potential mates and to potential uh, competitors based on their coloration and appearance. Uh, so you'll see, see things like owls and night jars that are very camouflaged, um, not having a lot of coloration to them, which benefits them during the day when they're sleeping. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to be uh, readily uh, viewed by a predator. And so they tend to have a bit of a different coloration based off of that. Uh, so it kind of extends beyond just the senses themselves and it goes into what these animals look like too. That's so cool. Bye. Um, what are some other examples? So there's some examples of like physical adaptations that completely change at night. Like I've heard, especially in birds, Olivia, I'm thinking about like, um, you know, owls and how large their eyes are to compensate for- Yeah lack of light. I don't know if you can speak to that, but I think that's a really cool way that the adaptations are actually changed to adapt to that darkness. Definitely. Owls are, I think, just one of the most well-adapted animals out there for the nocturnal life. Um, and yeah, their eyes, I actually have a oh, little owl skull. And so, yeah, they have huge eyes, as you can see in the skull. Um, and their eyes, unlike human eyes, which can go side to side to you creatures, theirs are locked into place. And it's because of this bone right here. This, oh my gosh, I'm so bad at pronouncing these scientific words, skull or something. Yes, yeah, okay. it's, a, it's an eye bone. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's good, I like it. Um, but, so they have huge eyes and they actually weigh 3% of their body weight. Um, oh but these, these eyes have um, lots of rods. So rods are um, the thing that helps you see movement and grayscale versus cones, which help you see color. Uh, mm -hmm. The owls have a lot more rods in their eyes. Um, and so since they can't move their eyes back and forth. They have 14 vertebrae, unlike us humans that have seven. 
And so that helps them move their neck um, to like almost 270 degrees either way. Um, so that's how they're able to um, kind of see their prey. Um, but they don't only have these really big eyes that are super cool. They also are really good at hearing. Mm -hmm. um, so some owls, like the sawwood owl, I don't know if you all know what they look like. They're about That's the size of a soda can. Definitely. They're so adorable. They're like the size of a soda can. And because they're so tiny, they can be predated by bigger owls like the great horned owl. Um, but they have asymmetrical ears. So they will have an ear up here and an ear down here. Um, and that helps them pinpoint whether a sound is coming from above, like a predator or uh, prey below them, uh, as well as listening to left and right. Um, and if you think of barn owls, they have that facial disc as well as some other owls too. That mm -hmm. helps. Satellite. Yeah, exactly. It's just like a satellite and it funnels sound into their ears. Um, I also have something else. I'm giving away all my tricks, but. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been I've been uh, set up here. So uh, owls have really fascinating feathers um, that help them um, stay quiet. So like um, Brett mentioned, a lot of nocturnal animals at night have developed hearing. Um, and so prey of owls have developed hearing so they can hear them coming. Um, and so owls have developed uh, very silent um, feathers or wings uh, so that their prey can't hear them coming. And part of that is, I don't know if you can see, there's mm -hmm. like comb-like projections on mm -hmm. the wing and that helps cut through the air. Um, so you don't get that swooshing sound and then on the un underside, they have these velvety soft feathers and that helps absorb the sound too. Um, but they, they are just amazing creatures and all these adaptations that they have from their uh, eyes to their feathers, to their hearing, it really helps them uh, be successful hunters of the night. That's great. I also heard once because they can't, um, they can't actually move their eyes um, owls are impossible or in, incapable of rolling their eyes at their parents <laughs> like human and I tried to like say that to my five-year-old who's starting to do that but he he has shown and proved to me that he certainly can move his eyes he's not an owl so <laughs> you know like give and take with your nocturnal adaptations I guess anyway. yes <laughs> Uh, so that's really awesome that we've kind of talked a little bit about how these animals survive and some of the senses that they use. So let's go ahead and dive a little maybe deeper into some of the specific animals. I know Olivia talked a little bit about owls, but let's hear from Jamie about some of the maybe nocturnal, the insects or invertebrates and how they kind of thrive in the nighttime. Nocturnal insects, nocturnal. Okay. I know you're ready to nerd out. I see the look on your face. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to go straight to um, fireflies or, <clears throat> excuse me, as I like to call them, lantern beetles. And I think yeah. you all join me in this effort, in this movement to replace fireflies with an appropriate <laughs> name of lantern beetles. Lantern beetles? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I can't help but think about, I think about the, when you're talking about nocturnal, you know, insects, you know, fireflies, um, I mean, sorry, lantern beetles. Lantern beetles. <laughs> um, and so what's, uh, what's really, really, so lantern beetles, they're in the order of coleoptera and they're in the family lamp pyridae. Is that not adorable or, mm -hmm. um, and they're known for their bioluminescence, right? Um, um, which is described as a language of light. Um, and, and it's used, and I love that because it's used, yeah. it's used for communication, most notably, right, for fi finding a mate. Um, so each, uh, each species of firefly has this very, uh, or I'm sorry, lantern, lantern beetle. Each. How are we going to get on this movement, Jamie? Lantern beetle. Lantern beetle. <laughs> <laughs> 
has a specific diagnostic flash pattern, okay? So typically the males are the flyers, you'll, that's, you know, that you'll see flying around. And the fireflies that we're going to have, that you will see, remember, don't forget, fireflies are real, like they're coming, we're going to have really warm weather, and it's going to be amazing. The fireflies we're going to see this summer are actually overwintering right now. Ooh. Yeah, so that's their life cycle. So they're overwintering right now, and then they will emerge, and they'll eat a little bit, then they'll pupate, and then they'll, and then they'll, um, uh, enter their last their last like stage of the life cycle which is the, the adults so the adults will emerge um and and they the males are typically the flyers and they'll fly around with their flash patterns very species specific flash patterns and the females um will be like all right i like you you're looking i like the way yeah and then they'll fly back and that's how they find a mate and they do it like that too they just is it like morse code like they're communicating via the way that they flash is that what yeah um can i share my screen i have a, a little yeah, go for it yeah okay 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 uh, oh i need to be able to okay one one moment okay there we are there we go okay 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 let me find it really quick okay i just wanted to here we go Okay, so I just wanted to show you really quick, which I think oh. is super neat. So um, so if you look at the number eight here on the screen, you can kind of see this J pattern. This is really, this is a very uh, common uh, flash pattern that I see in my own my own backyard. Um, and, and so you can, you can, you know, really strengthen your observation skills this summer if you've never really tuned in to what the flash patterns look like, that the specific flash, flash patterns, like watch, Watch individual fire or lantern beetles. Watch individual lantern beetles. Um, they'll this one. Um, I can't remember the name, um, but you can find them if you go to Firefly Firefly Watch. This that's a community science program. Mm -hmm. um, and the they this one uh, this species will dip down into a J shape. Another common one is the two spot, the two dots. So that'll blink twice, and then there'll be a long a long period of time in between the second the next set of blinks. Um, and then we also have uh, number two over here, this, um, the flash, 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 just like the continual flashing as well. Um, there's three, there's three common, uh, three genre of, of, of um, fireflies in, in Nebraska. And, and so that's pretty cool. And then for some really deep nerd stuff, we just really want to throw this like, you know, the weird in there too, because I like weird, gross science. Um, mm -hmm. We're here for it. Okay, here we go. Um, there's a specific species of fe uh, female in this, uh, the photorous genre, I do believe. And they are nicknamed femme fatales because, um, so most adult fireflies don't eat, don't eat. They don't, they, they typically do not eat, but these females do. Um, and they mimic the flash patterns of other species, other male species. And then they they lure the males in and then they eat them. No kidding. They've also been known to to steal the prey out of spider web, like the 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 fireflies that spiders have captured, and they'll go in the in there and steal those fireflies and eat them too. Wow! Holy smokes! Yeah, the idea, the theory is, is that they that they 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 don't have um they're they're stealing their toxins, they're eating them for their toxins called uh, lucid bugifigans, right? Sure, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they use this, right? They use <laughs> toxin and they'll, um, they'll uh, deposit it on their eggs as like a chemical defense for their, for, for their eggs. Wow. And, and this, and this behavior is called kleptoparasitism. Isn't that oh. awesome? I don't have a pen to write this down. We will be writing. I feel like my here. main takeaway from this, Jamie, is I need to know way more about lantern beetles because I had no idea how freaking amazing they are. Lantern beetles. We should make t-shirts, not fireflies, right? Everybody here. Hopefully we have 41 converts now, okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like I need to learn more about lantern beetles, especially before the summer. What is When is the best time in Nebraska to see them? Uh, what time of year, like... Is it June? Is it July? Like, do you know about like the I, I, if I remember uh, at the peak firefly season, I do believe is July fifteenth. Oh, great! I can't June believe fifth, June fifth. That was very specific. That is, yeah. I appreciate. I think that. it's July fifteenth. Okay, cool. Um, and they like um like wet, more wet areas. 
you know, so anything, you know, if you're in a, yeah. we, we don't have very many fireflies out in Western Nebraska because it's really dry, but the, Sorry, species, Olivia. the species I've seen out there, their flash patterns, totally different. And if you're used to the fireflies here in eastern Nebraska and you catch one out in western Nebraska, you'll be like, what is that thing and what is it doing? Because the flash pattern is, a that is so cool. It's really, really cool. It's communication of light. I think that's incredible. That's, yeah, amazing. I um, can't wait for the summer to see these. So I, know, you I saw them by Merritt at Merritt, over by Merritt Reservoir. Okay. <laughs> so obviously we have a lot of, so we have some um, nocturnal insects at night. We've heard a bit about owls. What about, are, we're gonna transition to you, Brett. No surprise, the bat guy. What about the, the things at night that and then eat the insects? Do you wanna to speak to that? So tell us yeah. a little bit about mammals at large, but specifically, what's everyone think about when we think about nocturnal mammals? I don't know, bats, bats. I'm not copper mice, but I yeah, love I, owls, think, yeah. I think about grasshopper mice too, because they <laughs> howl at the moon. How cool is that? Right. But you can talk about that. You can talk about bats all you want. So what do you want to speak to with bats as far as like how have they carved that niche and how have they adapted to the night? Yeah. So basically how it kind of worked out is that you had birds that kind of dominated during the day, but there was this ecological niche at night. As we know, insects are plenty active at night, whether you're super annoying mosquitoes all the way up to your June bugs that are buzzing around to moths. Uh, to whatever it might be. Uh, so as much as it might pain Jamie to hear this, uh, bats love to snack on uh, her favorite critters. Wait, so you got to say it because we have to call them the new thing. They like to eat for lantern beetles. Lantern, lantern beetles. beetles, we got it. They okay. do because lantern beetles are not tasty treats, but bats eat them. Is that is that really? As far as I know, they do. I mean, there's, there's an interesting um, kind of study that's going on. So there are certain types of moths uh, that apparently don't taste good to bats, uh, whether it be something they eat or some type of um, protein they produce in their bodies. Uh, but the bats will actually somehow find ways to avoid them. And there's a lot of different suggestions and ideas behind that. Uh, but anyway, so going back, so birds kind of dominate during the day. At night, there's this open niche that an animal can occupy and kind of exploit those resources. And so in North America, uh, predominantly in temperate regions, so further up north, uh, you get solely insectivorous bats. Uh, if you go down to the tropics, you get a crazy suite of uh, flying mammals at night. Uh, they'll eat anything from fruits and uh, nectar from pollinating plants uh, to things like uh, frogs and fish and some that even predate on other bats. So it's kind of so crazy. Cool. You told us this today and it blew my right. mind. That I had no idea. Bats. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Yeah. Not Nebraska, but still. Yeah. Yep. Still so the only ones we have in Nebraska are insectivorous bats. Okay. So if anybody ever says, I had a vampire bat in my house, you didn't. <laughs> if you have a fruit bat in your house, you didn't. You did it. <laughs> uh, it's only insectivorous bats. Uh, they're only eating bugs. They're only helping you out. Um, so give them a little pat on the back. Give them a break. If they get caught in your house, they get trapped every so often. They get lost. They can't figure out where they're going. Um, call a professional over, such as myself. I'll come over, help it out, uh, and let it out of your house for you. We're going to give everyone your cell phone number. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Dangerous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, so kind of going back to what Olivia was talking about with her owls, uh, kind of adapting to have those feathers that, um, you know, kind of reduce the sound and reduce the drag so that way um, the mice can't hear them. It's called an evolutionary arms race that's taking place. Mm. And there's something going on with that with bats and moths, which is really fascinating. And it's that bats echolocate at night. So they are looking for various flying insect prey, uh, predominantly moths. Moths are just big and juicy. They're delicious for bats. Um, and unlike beetles, they have those hard exoskeletons. Um, moths are a little bit more a little more juicy they're for bats. Tender. They're tender. Sweet. Yeah. Okay, I see that. Yeah, just, just right for them. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so these bats are looking for these moths. So they're out echolocating, basically seeking out these moths that are flying around. Well, these moths have actually developed, at least not all of them, but a handful of them have developed the ability to have ears or hearing. Now, they don't have ears on the side of their head, um, like we would think for ourselves, but they have actually ears in their abdomen that sense echolocation, um, sense the high-frequency noises. Uh, that these bats are putting out. Did you say, and I'm sorry, ears in the abdomen? Did I hear that correctly? Hear, yes. Out of their Basically eyes? out of their butts. They have butt ears. Okay. Basically. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Okay. So 
these, to make sure. these moths hear these bats getting closer and closer, and they have kind of one of a handful of strategies that they use. One is that they will emit a sound, and this sound will basically tell a bat, hey, I don't taste good, leave me alone. Mm. Uh, so this is a lot of your different hawk moth species, uh, some of your larger moths uh, will produce this sound that's like, hey, I don't taste good, leave me alone. Because, you know, again, we're talking about how you change your senses. So during the day, these animals that don't taste good have bright colorations to tell to tell a predator, hey, don't eat me. That doesn't really work as well at night. So they needed to come up with a different approach to that. So they'll actually produce a produce a sound uh, that tells a bat, hey, I don't taste good. Um, another approach is that it actually causes a direct stimulus to their flight muscles to where they detect an echolocation and they detect that wave of frequency. It'll cause their muscles and their wings to lock up and the bat will just drop straight out of the air <laughs> and it'll just land on the ground. And because they're so lightweight, it doesn't hurt them, but it keeps them alive. So, Wait, whoa. the moth drop The moth just drops straight out of the air. So it's not like I'm going to think about this. It goes directly to their like. Yep. It just immediate. Oh just my god! Because they don't have they don't have time to think about it. Because if they think Never. about it, they're it's like gone. it's like fight or flight. Exactly. Like I'm not yeah. thinking about it. I'm just I'm going to fuck. I'm going to have it. They're going to yeah. they're going to drop. Oh my gosh. But my that favorite is cool. one is there is this kind of third approach really? they do. And it's called jamming, and it's just it's amazing. So picture you are eating at night. You don't have any light whatsoever. You're just kind of going off the motion. Okay. And that's doing this. It's echolocating. It detects an, uh, a moth flying around. It's like, okay, here's my food. It's dinner time. Come in to eat. As soon as he's right about to open his mouth to eat it, bang, you hear this loud noise. And that's what these uh, moths are doing. They're creating a loud pulsing sound. Now, granted, it's higher than what we can hear, but it basically startles the bat and jams the bat signal. And now the bat can't Whoa. figure out where the moth is. It's like if your fork like blew up right before you. Basically, well, that or if you were like about to yeah. say goodbye and the air horn goes off. So I have to say, you were supposed to talk about how freaking cool bats were. Jamie was supposed to speak about moths. All I'm hearing for you is how cool moths are. That was a lot of overlap. <laughs> I know. I'm just saying, like, of like how cool moths are at evading bats. That's incredible. Yeah. And that uh, evolutionary arms race is so cool. It's something that we don't really think about. A it lot, happens a lot with lots of different types lots of animals. Lots of different yeah. stuff. That exactly. is super cool. Okay. So I wow. heard this too. Sean, I think, has talked about this. And you kind of mentioned it today too, that they, you know, we were always told that bats, you know, can eat like 1,200 mosquitoes a night or something like that. But it's not really worth their time. It's more the moths, right? That they want to eat. I know there's some that spend yeah. their time eating them, but. Yeah, it really depends on the species. Uh, so we have a kind of a suite of size ranges of our different bat species in Nebraska. How many bats do we have in Nebraska? Does Currently we have 13 okay. species. It's a little bit up for debate. We like to take credit for species that we barely detect here. Uh, so in the panhandle of Nebraska, we have a single record of a Townsend figured bat, which is this really cool bat. They have these great big ears. Uh, back from 1970, and we haven't detected it since. We've put a ton of effort in. Mm. We haven't found it, so it was just one... We, we call it a vagrant record because it's not something we typically see here. They're close by, they're up in the Black Hills and they're over in Wyoming, but we only have one record in Nebraska, but we cling to that record and say, oh, we have 13 species because we have uh, Townsend's bigger than that. So 12. 12, 12, 12, 12 and a half. Yeah, 12 and a half. so 12 and a half. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, yeah, so these bats operate on a suite of different sizes. So your smaller bats, um, like your little brown bats and your tricolored bats, those are bats that are gonna specialize on your smaller insect species. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what they're they're good at. That's what they focus on. So all those studies that come out that say that bats eat X number of mosquitoes a night, uh, those studies have been done on little brown bats. Mm -hmm. So a really small species. Um, but then you go kind of on the larger end, you have things like your big browns, your hoary bats, uh, which are mar much larger bats. And they'll specialize in things like moths and beetles uh, because they have a bit stronger musculature in their faces that they can actually chew mm. up those beetles a little bit better. Those smaller species would really struggle with that and yeah. take a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, another niche to occupy. Exactly. Yeah. That's cool, huh? So, and huh. you have to remember that flight is really expensive. And so for these bats, they have to really maximize that amount of time that they have at night. So not only are they flying around trying to get food, evading predators, uh, but a lot of times when they're active in the summer, they have pups back at their roost. So females will form these large maturity colonies in the summer uh, where they'll basically have this nursery of baby bats, uh, whether it be in a tree, potentially, unfortunately, your addict, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And so they'll go out, they'll feed for a little bit, they'll come back, feed their pups, go back out, and just basically keep repeating that cycle throughout the course of the night. So 
it's a lot of work for them, but they yeah. make it work out. And you said flight is expensive, and just to make sure we got it, um, it's not expensive. Like I know that when I'm trying to buy uh, an airplane, it's, it's expensive. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're talking energy it's not expensive. Energy, energy expensive. expensive. Right. Think about the difference in how much energy you put out uh, walking versus swimming. True. Swimming is a whole lot more energy intensive than just walking. I, and I like to think about when I'm trying to when I'm trying to think about e ecological things like this and the way animals have to move through the world. It is true to use that word expensive because it's like energy to them is it's almost like our currency is it's like our exactly yeah. yeah and they have to constantly weigh how energy expensive something is to go gain some food versus you know um, protecting themselves from predators all those things so yeah that's really cool that's good well so we kind of heard a lot about how these animals rely in the darkness and they survive in the darkness and it's it's their niche that they fill but I don't know about a lot of you guys but it doesn't seem as dark as it normally has. In the past, I've noticed that there's a lot more street lights out. There's a lot more houses. People are out at night. If you've ever looked at one of those like satellite images about how much light certain cities produce, it doesn't look too dark. So there's this thing that we've talked about called light pollution. Um, you know, we like light and we rely on it, but it can pollute the night. Do you guys want to touch a little bit about maybe what light pollution is, and then talk a little bit about how that affects your um, certain kind of species you're talking about, mammals, birds. Um, insects, that kind of thing. Sure. Um, so there's a few different types of light pollution. There's the sky glow, which is the brightening of the night sky from human caused light. Um, and then there's the glare, which is the direct shining of light. Um, mm -hmm. And something that uh, you might not think about with um, the night sky is a lot of songbirds, which are typically diurnal, um, so they're active during the day. Um, when it comes to spring and fall migration, they're migrating at night. Um, and so the way they do this is as young, they imprint on the night sky. So they're imprinting on where the North Star is and the patterns of stars that rotate around the North Star. Oh. Um, and so when um, they're migrating, this light pollution can cause them to have trouble seeing the night sky. Um, it can also draw these uh, migrating songbirds into these cities where they can collide with buildings, unfortunately, or just get exhausted from confusion on um, where they should be going. Um, and so that's something that you don't often think about because they're not typically nocturnal animals, but um, yeah, songbirds are really affected by, by light pollution. Um, nocturnal insects are the same as well. So um, moonlight, like sunlight, scatters when it um, strikes tiny particles in the atmosphere. And so um, this gives rise to like what is called celestial polarization patterns, right? Can you say it one more time because it sounds like an so, amazing. So, so celestial polarization patterns, and it's just no it's the polarization of light as 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 it hits as it goes through the atmosphere and it and it, and it hits up particles in the atmosphere. Wow. So, um, and it, you know, I'm I'm summing it up because it's like this big expansive thing that I spent way too much time looking up, and I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> okay. Because I don't think I'm actually capable of doing that. But um, so. Um, so what happens with nocturnal insects is that um, they position they position themselves at a fixed angle to to that light at, 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 and, and the relative celestial objects, and then they travel in a straight line mm. relationship to to that polarized light. You know, and so when there's um, uh, moths, moths are a good example with. Um, you know, on your porch lights and, and, and there's always so many moths and they just keep coming back and it's because they realign themselves to, to the celestial light, which is your, oh. and so then they keep, and that's why they get, and that's just one way that they navigate in, in, in the darkness, but it's, that's why light pollution is, you know, really can mess up, mess up things for nocturnal insects as well. Good. You both speak to the fact that different animals actually use celestial navigation, which is something even as a wildlife nerd, I only learned recently, like in the last few years, and it blew my mind because because even like dung beetles, and I know, dung, well, we have dung beetles in Nebraska, I suppose, 
but dung beetles, they actually, they have found studies that they align with how they're going to like move their little home of a little, a ball of dung along the Milky Way. And so they literally, like, like what Olivia said and like what everyone said, yep, yeah, there you go. Wow, this is amazing. Do you want to speak to that, Jamie? Because you got this up and you're ready to go. Let's well, go. just real quick. I mean, and I, I, please please love continue, dumb beetles I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I mean, no, like, I love it. How cute. this is the African dumb beetle. We do have dumb beetle in Nebraska, but this is okay. like this cute guy. And so uh, just real quick, and then please continue, Amber. Um, this, B, the circle B here is um, during an, uh, a new moon, you know, so there's not as much um, light, light, right? And so, um, or they're uh, during a moon, during a full moon. And so there's more light and they can see um, uh, the, the, the pattern, the path that the dung beetle is taking is more direct and, and, and straight. Mm. And, and C is, is, is not, it's, um, it's a moon, it's a, a moonless night is they're seeing. So their, their, their pattern and their direction is more random. Oh, cool. That's amazing. So and please so continue with, with dung no, beetles. Yeah. So, so cool. it's just this whole world of, of nocturnal creatures that not only are they having all these really cool adaptations and these physical adaptations, but they're literally using some of them like the night sky as a map as a roadmap to get where they need to go or to do the things they need to do to survive. And it seems to me that as we um, are more populated and we're putting out more light at night, because it's helpful for us, um, it's something that you don't think about, but it's, you know, light pollution is a thing. And if, if animals rely on darkness or they rely on being able to see that night sky, obviously that's gonna affect them a bit. Like if we're, if I'm trying to drive around New York City without Google Maps or it keeps freezing up or something, I probably wouldn't do very well because this is what I rely on for navigation. So what is something that um, we can do to help prevent light pollution? Is there things that we can do? Are there, are there initiatives? Are there things happening to like help speak to that problem of light pollution and thinking about those nocturnal creatures. Any of you guys can speak to that. Well, so one thing I think of is, as kids were taught, you know, when you leave a room, turn out the lights. Mm. But yet as adults, we always have our lights on outside. So we have our front porch light on. Um, or lights shining on our house. And so the, I think the simplest thing that you can do is just turn off your lights if you're not using them. Um, there's also a number of like light fixtures that you can put up that cover the tops and the sides and that will help um, prevent light pollution. Um, but if you go to darksky.org, they have a ton of solutions um, for your house and for your communities and getting involved um, with trying to make your communities even dark sky friendly. That's really cool. And Jimmy, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know that you did some work, I think last year about like dark skies in general and even with merit right here in Nebraska. Can you talk about mm -hmm. that for a second? Because I think that's the coolest thing. Yeah, it's really, it's really exciting. So um there are in a, um, inter an international dark sky park association is is responsible for you know um, putting together the um, the list of qualifications that would that a park would would have to um, have to maintain or to have an international dark sky park designation. And we uh, uh, as of last year, Merritt Reservoir. Um, is uh, an international dark sky park. It's Nebraska's first. And wow. it's, it's so cool, isn't That's it? amazing. Yeah, we have our I know they have international party out there every year. So it's yeah, like yeah. known for, for star nerds, I guess. Where mm -hmm. is Merritt in relation, if we have, if our audience had not heard of it, where is Merritt, would you say in Nebraska? It's west, okay. in the middle west. <laughs> so it's west. Okay, fair. I'm fair. pointing to the east right now, it's that way. That's cool. It's, so it seems to me like we've added that because, and a lot of the things we're talking about tonight is, it seems like the night sky is just another natural resource that maybe we take for granted sometimes. And so I guess my question for you is why, and you can start right here, but um, why do you feel like the night sky is a, is a natural resource and why should we think more about it? Why should we not take the night sky for granted um, for us or for critters and anything else? Yeah, so I think for, 
for our wild animal species, I mean, we've kind of discussed about it a bit tonight, is how dependent they are on the night sky in order for navigation and in order for feeding and predation and things like that. You know, it's a very important aspect to it, whether it be uh, the moonlight or whether it be the stars, both of them are incredibly important uh, for your nocturnal species. And so by essentially bleaching out that night sky, by uh, incorporating light pollution into the, into the equation, uh, you're disrupting those natural patterns and it increases stress levels in these animals, uh, which are already stressed and heightened up. Um, and then in addition to that, you have the aspect of they have reduced food availability mm -hmm. just because of everything that we have going on, uh, whether it be the pesticides that we're spraying to keep those insect level down mm -hmm. at levels down or, you know, destroying the native habitat in order to, you know, build whatever it is we want to build. Right. Um, so they're already at a heightened level of stress and we're just kind of compounding on that with things that we aren't taking into account ourselves because they're things that we don't think that we right. use. We're, we're diurnal ists. We're like, we're diurnal creatures, so we don't really think about like yeah. how necessary that is. That's good. And he, yeah, yeah, we go see ahead. the night as sometimes like an inconvenience. Yeah, like we're sleeping. Like, yeah, it. why why does it need that? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Do you have anything to add, Olivia or Janie, on why you feel like the night sky is an incredible natural resource that we shouldn't take for granted? Uh, simply, uh, we don't know what we don't know. Love this. Ta da! Mm -hmm. Love it. There's all sorts of things that we don't know. And so it's a, it's important. Yeah. Just yeah. like um, all, all the life in the, in the prairies, the prairies that we've lost in, in our, in our habitat, in our home habitat, you know? Mm -hmm. That's good. And it's a source of inspiration and creativity. And I mean, if you're looking up at the night sky, I mean, I've never felt so small and so grounded and, you know, it's just, it's an important resource for animals and for humans. Absolutely agree with that, Livia. That was the last question we were going to ask you. Yeah, we were just going to ask why is the night sky important for humans too? So Olivia kind of covered that, but um, Jamie and Brett, do you have anything to add why it's important for us and not just animals, but for, but for humans too? Mm -hmm. Some stuff on this real quick, you know, uh, we think about circadian rhythms and our, and, um, and, and melatonin, right? So our bodies, um, um, so humans adhere to a circadian rhythm, right? Our biological clock and our bodies produce the hormone, um, melatonin in response to circadian rhythms, you know, mm -hmm. and, and melatonin helps us sleep. And, um, it also has antioxidant properties. And, um, it also boosts our immune system, lowers cholesterol. What else uh, helps for the helps the functioning of thyroid, pancreas, ovaries, testes, and adrenal glands. Holy smokes! I mean, it's a super important hormone in our body, and if we disrupt that hormone in our body with our natural, you know, with unnatural light during during the night, when our cir circadian rhythms are being, you know, because we evolved with association with our environment during the night because we are diurnal beings. Mic drop, mic drop right there. That's, cool. that's, on me. that's amazing. So it's not just the fluffy stuff. Like to me, the night sky is inspirational and it's grounding like Olivia said, and that's really important, but you're speaking to, um, maybe we take for granted, it's even biologically important yeah. for us. That is super cool, Jamie. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, just echoing Jamie's sentiments on that, you know, it's very important for keeping our rhythms up. I've completely screwed mine up through the years by working with bats at night. Uh, an impressive challenge switching from that to a to an eight to four job, um, which is a fun challenge to have. Have you at least adapted like echolocation then to <laughs> I like haven't. That's too bad. Yeah, it's a, so you're not Batman is what you're I got the glasses, so apparently I, I've lost the, the visual cues, but yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. I, I agree with all of what you're saying and I feel like especially um, in, a, in a world where we feel maybe there's less opportunity for us to be connected to the natural world that we're a part of, night sky is one of the most um, incredible sources that we can do. And even like us working with kiddos and even my own son, I mean, I make it a point to some, like as much as we can go out and see the night sky, see the moon and just be observant of, it's almost like gives us a place of where we are. Have you ever seen that meme when you're stressed out and it's a big picture of our Milky Way galaxy and there's a tiny arrow that says, you are here. Yep. That right there is why I appreciate the night sky because it helps ground me like what you said, Olivia. 
and it just it, it helps you know paint that bigger picture so that's that's really good appreciate all of that um do you want to do yeah. a lightning round yeah so usually what we do about the last five minutes or so we have some questions from the audience and we have a couple of questions that people have asked um when they register so we're going to kind of go as quickly as possible um so we'll ask those i know some people have put some stuff in the chat and then if one of you um ex or uh, nature nerd night people would like to um answer that um so if someone asks uh, which animals are like specific um like full moon only um are there any or what animals like when are and maybe they're just talking about olivia what you had mentioned before of when they're most active yeah okay. yeah um so what i was talking about is like so there's night jars so night hawks and whippoorwills um they are most active during full moon so um that's because they rely on their sight to see the insects that they're eating. Um, mm -hmm. And so they are like twice as active during full moons than they are when there's no moon out. And there's also, sorry, I'm gonna go off no. on a tangent because I found this. Um, there's this gull that only um, uh, eats during new moon. So when it's completely dark, uh, and it's in the Galapagos. And so it forages on zooplankton and little fish that come up to the surface of the water only when it's dark out. Um, and so they're able to dive down like the meter distance to grab them. But when it's a full moon, the, these uh, zooplankton and little fish are too deep for them to get. So they don't forage on them. So super that's, cool. <laughs> that's super cool. Jamie actually just recently returned from the Galapagos. So she could pop, I know, right? I know, Everyone, jaw drop, it. jaw drop. She's yep. the coolest nature nerd. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of cool that um, that specific thing happens, you know, only during those full moons. Uh, someone also asked, um, I guess this is more of a statement, but uh, Jamie, maybe you could speak to it a little bit, that they've noticed that earlier lantern beetles have kind of like a yellowish color, and then the later ones have like a greenish. Is there a different? Hmm colors to their bioluminescence um is that species specific or is that kind of just a an observation that people can make about objectively speaking the colors um i i there are it is species specific okay. so there, there is there's a green and then there's amber and i do believe that there is red as well in the u.s um uh, i and i think that's that's basically and i i think i've seen amber but mostly green, the neon green color. Um, so um, yes, definitely dig into that. That and it's in it's easily accessible, but it's not in my working memory at the moment. Well, that's a great observation that that person. Yeah. Yeah, like, definitely. Way to go. Yes. Uh, Brett, you might know this one. Um, how many Nebraska bat species can be found in that Creatures of the Night exhibit? Do you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, good simple answer: intentionally zero. Okay. Um, there are big brown bats that love to hang out in Henry Dory Zoo and many other parts of eastern Nebraska. They'll, they're the most common species you find in your house. Um, but for the species that are actually kept in captivity, bats, especially insectivorous bats, are very hard to maintain and manage. Uh, kudos to our um, Nebraska Wildlife Rehab who takes in bats yeah. throughout the winter and feeds them, keeps them going. Uh, because it's a full-time job keeping them going. Yeah. Uh, so the bats that they have in the creatures of the night at the zoo are predominantly your uh, fruit-eating bats. Uh, you've probably seen some of the vampire bats, and then they also have fishing bats as well. Um, blows my mind they have fishing bats in there. I'm not 100% sure mm -hmm. how they're able to keep them going, but they've had a population there for years, so clearly they're doing something that I am unfamiliar with. Maybe there's like a secret Olympic pool in the back or something where they get to go they can lean out who knows we don't know it's cool um and then we actually had a really good question from someone in our um that registered earlier for this uh they talked a little bit and we didn't really mention it but they talked a little bit about when is the next solar and lunar eclipse so we just had one here what in 20 is it 17 um that how did that like affect animals like you know for that split second you want to observe those animals but you want to look you know as far up as you can to see what's happening and i was like what are animals doing during this lunar eclipse? Or I think there were some cool studies done. Yeah, yeah. What, can you guys speak a little bit to like how that affects animals and um, either a lunar or a solar eclipse? If you know. If you don't, that's okay. Yeah. I can just speak to my my own personal observation. Yeah. I didn't, and I, I did see, um, and it was a UNL published paper 
on um, social media observations during that during the 2017 solar eclipse. So that might be a cool thing to check out. Um, um, and and um, but um, it was you know middle of the day, and then as the eclipse started happening, what did we hear? What what, what changes did we hear? We heard yeah. heard cicadas, right? They started yeah. thinking like it was the it was the end of the day. They were confused. Yeah, mm -hmm. their show started early. Yeah, that's true. Did you notice anything, or do you can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I was gonna gonna comment with what uh, Jamie mentioned about there was a big publication that came out of UNL that actually highlighted that event that took place mm. uh, a few years ago and kind of compiled records as to what animal behaviors were observed uh, during that time. I haven't had a chance to read it myself, but um, I'm pretty sure that will give a really That's good summary cool. of what's we out can, there. Yeah, we, we can, uh, that. to all those people that registered, we'll send out an evaluation. We can totally put that in our resources as well for people, so. I just popped the link in the chat too. Oh, oh awesome. awesome. Thanks, Thank Jamie. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, are there any last questions from our participants tonight before we wrap up? Another Nebraska Nation or night. Sweet. I have one suggestion real quick. Yes, go for it. So May 15th, there's a full moon and that overlaps okay. with songbird migration. So if you have a telescope or a spotting scope, you point it at the moon and you might see some songbirds flying through um, as they're migrating by and you might even hear them calling. So that's amazing. Olivia. But that's that in your calendar. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And that's during Nebraska Bird Month. It is. Exactly. Nebraska, Nebraska Bird Month. I kind of like smell a program there or something. <laughs> like moonlight migration something. Okay, let's oh, check. Okay. Alliterations. Oh, so good. <laughs> I know. That's why we're nerds. It's fine. Thank you so much for joining us. We also want to thank our awesome three, I'm going to call you nerds, nature nerds that joined us tonight. So Olivia, Jamie, and Brett, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight and giving us all your um, nature knowledge nuggets. Um, that was <laughs> I botched that. It's so. okay. um, but yeah, if you would please join us for our next Nebraska Nature Nerd Night. We're going to be talking about fungi. So fantastic fungi. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have someone from the university come talk about some studies that they've done. And then also Chance Bergerman is going to be talking to us from Northern Prairie Land Trust. He's down in uh, Indian Cave State Park. So um, very cool. So please join us on April 19th for that. So yeah, otherwise, we all good? Okay, Thanks, I'm gonna everyone. go. Um, it's a full moon tomorrow. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get my telescope out, and um, so I guess I'll catch you guys later because that's what I'm gonna be doing. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>